Let's talk about the evolution of stars. Sorry for the Yo Mama So Fat. There's actually two of them in this set. So Yo Mama So Fat, her location on the HR diagram is with the red giants. That's really nerdy. And of course, nothing against anybody's mother. Uh, those are just dumb jokes. So let's look at this HR diagram, as it's called. This is the Hertzsprung Russell diagram. Um, this is a diagram that's it's kind of like the periodic table, but for uh, astronomers. It's that useful. We put pretty much everything on it. Remember we learned about luminosity? That's what goes here on this y-axis, the luminosity of a star. Remember, so that's going to be really important. L is luminosity, and T is going to be the surface temperature in Kelvin. In the old syllabus, you had to know about uh, the spectral classes, you know, O, B, A, F, G, K, M, but you don't really have to know that. You kind of just have to know that this is the um, temperature. Remember, temperature kind of has to do with color as well, so it's maybe not a bad idea to, to have an idea about the colors, right? These are red. Well, I guess I shouldn't have drawn that in any other color than red, right? So this is uh, kind of red here. And on the other extreme, this will be something that's blue because those are the rough uh, ideas about the temperatures, remember? And you should have some idea about the temperature. You don't have to know exactly every one of these temperatures, but know something that like over here is around 30,000 Kelvin and over here is about 3,000 Kelvin. Just have an idea about what the little red ones look like compared to what the big uh, blue ones look like. Remember, red is not very hot. T, uh, this right here is uh, cool. Now this, this axis is a bit reversed. You would think that the temperature should go up in temperature, but in fact, this HR diagram, it's done backwards here. So in other words, large temperature here, smaller temperature here. Uh, this is because if you do a, a map of most of the stars that you find, you'll find, and this I'm showing you the diagram because you should be able to draw this, okay? So I'm showing you first what it's drawn like. A rough idea is something like this right here, and these stars are here called the main sequence stars. That's what these are. These are the main sequence stars. So most of them are found somewhere here. It's maybe not quite so fat, like so thick here, but something like this. Most stars are found here. By the way, most stars, when they do this, they're burning hydrogen to helium. This is what they're doing. They're busy converting hydrogen to helium in their cores. This is just because most of them, you know, the blue ones are really luminous. The red ones are not very luminous at all. So they seem to be found on this, what we call main sequence. But there's uh, some other regions you need to know about. One of them right here is called the Red Giants. And you have to know about this area down here called White Dwarf. That's the other area. You may want to know over here is actually Red Super Giants, actually, it turns out, up here. But turns out, uh, well, we'll talk about evolution in a second. But the main idea behind this is this. I mean, yes, this is useful for a lot of things, but you can also tell the distance to a star. That's what's kind of cool about it. Watch. Remember to get the distance of a star, we have this equation here, L, uh, whoops, B equals L over 4 pi d squared. Remember that one from before? Well, if we can know the luminosity, we can know the distance, right? And Because B is easy, you can measure that on Earth. So how do you do this? If you see a star right here, what you do is, it's called spectroscopic parallax, even though it has nothing to do with the parallax method. What you do is, you would spot, ah, let's see here, uh, maybe we find a star that... You know, maybe it seems like a main sequence. So from its um, spectrum, we can tell it's a main sequence. So maybe it's something like here. And from there, you know, because you can tell that by its color. Remember, you can tell that because of its peak wavelength. So its peak wavelength tells you its temperature. And temperature and color are related, right? So once you know its temperature, then you can guess at its luminosity. Now keep in mind, there's a lot of sort of fuzziness, sort of, you know, wobbliness in the answer, which means there's going to be a lot of, you know, uncertainty in its luminosity. So that's why you can tell the luminosity pretty well. Once you know luminosity, then you know, you know, D. Right? That's sort of the idea behind it. It's not so simple. Right? But that's why I'm just going to delete maybe these steps just so I don't screw up the nice drawing here. But you can tell the distance to a star by this method. So that's why I see her location is within the red giants because red giants are very luminous. They're also big. Uh, so let's do the next one here. This is uh, actually a more detailed, obviously, uh, version of the HR diagram, the Hertzsprung-Russell. You can see luminosity and temperature. You can see a lot more detail. This is the sun right here. So I just want to show you this. This is actually pretty important. You can tell a couple of other really cool things about it. Uh, first of all, see these um, diagonal lines here? They tell you something about the size of the star. So you can see 10 to the minus 3 solar radiuses. In other words, very, very small. That's why they're dwarfs. 
Whereas obviously the sun should be found as one solar radius, I hope. Um, but see, red giants are bigger, right? 10 times the size of the sun. Or up here is 100 times the size of the sun. And Betelgeuse, for example, is 1,000 times the radius of the sun. So those, those lines sort of tell you that. Also, they've sort of drawn them in colors too, little red ones over here. Um, and they're, they're literally smaller. But there's also something about lifetime, it turns out. The lifetime, you don't have to know this for the syllabus, but I think it's really interesting. The lifetime of stars is also related. So over here, they're only 10 to the 7 years, which seems like a lot, but it's not really. That's only like 10 million years. That's really young compared to the age of the universe. Whereas these little dwarves, their lifetime is, you know, much more than the age of the universe. Which means, you know, these little white, uh, red dwarfs, they pretty much stay forever. Whereas these ones right here are sort of like the live fast and die young kind of stars because they burn so much fuel so fast, they die really quickly. And we're going to learn that they do some really cool things. So that's a better HR diagram. So what's going on in these stars? In other words, if we go back here, you know, we talked about they're burning hydrogen to helium. What's the main process behind this? Well, we go into more detail on the HL uh, topic, but I mean, I think it's nice just to have an idea about what this hydrostatic equilibrium means. In the core of a star, because you're burning hydrogen to helium, remember you get this energy, you know, equals mc squared. So this energy uh, turns out, well, it makes light, doesn't it? That's one of the things it does. That's remember we talked about. That's why stars are bright. That's also why they're hot. Well, it turns out light pushes. You wouldn't think it. I mean, right now I've got light bouncing off my uh, more than ample forehead right now. So these, the light that's bouncing from my forehead, for example, you wouldn't think, like, oh, I'm being pushed. But I kind of am. Light actually pushes. There's an outwards radiation pressure. So actually there is a pressure. There is a force outwards caused by that effect. So anytime you're making this reaction, you're making light and the light is actually pushing outwards. But of course, pushing against it is its own gravity, this star itself. This is the main process going on in stars. So gravity acts inwards, right? The mass itself acts inwards, but the radiation, the core radiation pressure acts outwards. And it's a constant battle between the two. They're always fighting each other. That's the key thing to know here. Uh, so now let's talk about this is where we get a little bit sort of into the weeds here, but I think it's really important. Um, we're going to go into more detail again in the HL, but in the SL, you're supposed to know a bit about it. So that's why I wanted to put this in. Uh, we're going to see why your mama so fast she approaches the Chandra Sekar limit for rotating mass. Okay, let's. What is this? Well, this basically says that, I and mean, we go into more detail in the HL about what happens at different levels, but the main thing to remember is just this there's an outwards pressure and there's an inwards pressure of gravity. So what happens when a star runs out of hydrogen in its core? Because it'll burn it all up. It'll convert it all to helium. That means it no longer has the pressure outwards. So what do you think happens? Well, it gives up. It stops pushing outwards. So what happens? The gravity wins. It squishes it. So this is what's going to happen. And it's going to be this process is going to repeat. That's the HL version. We go into more detail there. But basically, it's always going to be this process of sort of, you know, it it tries to push till it runs out of fuel, then it gives up. It's like, I can't even. Uh, then the uh, gravity pushes it inwards. It squishes it till it's enough to then fuse the next element, helium, into maybe carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, for example. It's called the CNO cycle, uh, and so on and so on. So what we do is we talk about this idea about, well, what happens to a star? Well, what happens to a star like our own, like our own sun? It's going to do this. It's going to get squished, sure, um, because when it runs out of hydrogen, it's going to be squished. Its path is actually then, once it gets squished, it's a weird thing. When the core collapses, it turns out the outer parts expand. Um, in detail, it's called the shell launch. It's something weird. Whatever the whatever one shell does, the other one does. So uh, the opposite. So for example, when the core is going to collapse until it's hot enough to burn helium, the outer part is going to expand. So what's going to happen? Our own sun is going to go sort of up to the red giants. But eventually, and it's probably going to do that, and then maybe then it'll sort of be able to fuse maybe helium into carbon and nitrogen. And there it may actually run out. It may actually be done then. Maybe it'll go a couple more stages, a couple levels of elements sort of higher. But until eventually, it won't be able to push anymore. So what's the eventual fate of our sun? It's going to go down to be a white dwarf.
That's because it won't be able to push outwards anymore. So gravity is going to squish it. But gravity doesn't squish forever. Gravity actually stops at some point. So this is the key thing here. What happens is this. At some point, it sort of says, like, I can't even, it can't push outwards anymore. And it turns out this really clever guy named Chandrasekhar, he was so clever. He did so many things. One of the things, he figured out the maximum mass of a stable white dwarf star. In other words, this is really important. This is not the mass at the beginning of its life. This is the remnant mass. In other words, this is the mass when the star is done. That's because the star is always using up mass. It's really important to know that, okay? So when the star has done all this process, if the remnant mass is less than 1.4 times the mass of the sun, if it's less than this Chandrasekhar limit, right? The Chandrasekhar limit is this, right? It's this. That's the maximum mass of a white dwarf star is 1.4 times the mass of the sun now. Obviously, our own sun can't gain mass, so our sun is going to be like this. It'll end up as a white dwarf. Why is that? Because there's this sort of pushing effect. Instead of pushing outwards, you know, it can't push anymore, so gravity wins. But gravity wins until something pushes back. It's not radiation anymore. So the analogy I'm going to use is rock climbing because I really like climbing. So imagine then you're climbing up a cliff. And what happens, of course, you've got gravity acting downwards, don't you? You've got gravity always acting down. So what happens is this, as you sort of give up, this is like gravity pushing downwards. It's like this uh, rock climber girl right here falling. So what happens if you fall? Well, of course, let's assume you don't have a rope. Uh, so that's super dangerous. But maybe there's a ledge there. This ledge will basically stop you. Can you imagine then you'd end up here, right? So this girl right here, she'd end up here, which would be really good for her, right? Because she'd end up at this ledge and then she wouldn't die. So this would be this something that pushes against gravity. And what pushes against it? It's called electron degeneracy pressure. It's a complicated uh, quantum mechanical thing, actually. Uh, it has to do with something called the Pauli exclusion principle. It's this idea about how you can stack electrons, basically. And you can't stack electrons any tighter, which means as you're pushing this thing inwards, as gravity's pushing inwards, these electrons are basically pushing outwards. Uh, another analogy I heard is like if you're like on a bus and you got some, you know, a bunch of, you know, really thick shouldered people are sitting on a bus and you can't really squish them much more, you know, so that's sort of like that. They're kind of resisting. So that's this first step here. But what if your mass is bigger than this? So what if your remnant mass is bigger than 1.4 uh, solar masses? Then what's going to happen is you basically break this. Can you imagine it's like you have enough gravity to like crush through this piece of rock? So you start falling again. So this right here would be the, um, this is the, um, this is this here. Whoops, I should have written it like this, hold on. I should have said it's like 1.4 times the solar mass. That's this Chandrasekhar limit. However, if you go even further down, so if you're even more massive, you can basically break through those electrons. You crush those, but there's another place you can stop. And this is where if your remnant, remember it's your remnant, because these stars start off with a lot more than this. They can have like, you know, up to like 20, even 30 times the mass of the sun, something like that. Or well, not quite 30, but around there. Uh, so if the remnant mass is between like 1.5-ish, in other words, greater than 1.4, as long as it's between 1.4 and about three solar masses, if the remnant, the resulting mass, after it's done all the stuff, used up a lot of mass, what will happen then? It's going to blow up. It's going to go supernova. And in the HL, we go into this in a lot more detail. But basically, it'll explode and become a neutron star. Why a neutron star? Because this, this right here is the maximum mass of a neutron star. So it's called uh, the Oppenheimer-Volkov limit. And it's due to what we call electro, uh, sorry, neutron degeneracy pressure. So this is if your mass is somewhere between you know 1.5, let's say, and um, this would be mass, and maybe 3 solar masses. This is your sort of other savior here. And you might wonder what happens if it's even more massive than this. Well, then you kind of break physics. You sort of break through it, you kind of break things, and you make a black hole. So kind of crazy, huh?